Good morning, and welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. So, left my home of 25 years behind. I am currently just outside of Pittsburgh and about ready to uh, conduct my second tour event, and this one taking place at the Moonshot Museum. And then after that, I'm going to be on my way to Toronto on Thursday, the 7th of September, and I have a space reserved for that. If you're interested in coming to that event, well, all the details are in the description. Okay, enough of that. Let's talk a little bit about Mars. Now, I've had a number of videos about Mars over the years, and oftentimes I like to talk about alternative methods of colonizing the red planet, because after all, this is what a lot of us are very interested in, <laughs> for most of which I suppose would be Elon Musk. But there are problems with Elon's plan, even though Starship, in my opinion, is the ultimate in interplanetary spacecraft, and it will revolutionize spaceflight and make interplanetary travel a possibility, the prison of Earth's gravity remains a significant obstacle, not only to Starship itself, but to any refueling efforts that we might have to undertake in order to get Starship to Mars in the first place, because obviously Starship needs to be refueled at least half a dozen times, maybe more, in order to get it to the Red Planet, and <laughs> that's a lot of launches, a lot of fuel, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of expense. Is there a better way to do this? Is there a way to beat the system, to beat Earth's gravity, to make it to where we don't have to overcome that, at least not as often or not as much, and colonize Mars in the space of maybe 10 years with a different kind of system that still involves Starship? Well, as a matter of fact, there is. A few years ago, there was a presentation made at the Mars Society that involved not only Starship, but also an innovation by Buzz Aldrin called the Mars Cycler. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard of this concept as well, but it actually started out as a lunar cycler. And the idea is to have a ship providing constant and recurring transportation to and from Mars, um, simply following an orbital path that uh, involves both planets, and then to simply hitch a ride on this cycler when it comes by. And this saves a tremendous amount of fuel and makes the possibility of colonizing the red planet in 10 years very, very doable. So here's the difference between the Elon Musk model for going to Mars and the Buzz Aldrin Mars Colonization Cycler concept, as it is called. Elon proposes that we send Starship into orbit, refuel it several times with a number of tankers, presumably these tankers providing fuel to some sort of fuel depot in orbit, and then once Starship has enough fuel in order to make the rest of the journey, off they go, whereas the cycler concept puts a ship on a path that constantly intercepts Mars and Earth on a recurring basis, spending most of its time on a trajectory that doesn't put it in close proximity with either planet and only carries out these recurring visits while the planets are closest to one another. The advantages to this system are obvious. You only need the fuel necessary to make the transition from Earth to Mars once. The interplanetary ship only needs to be fueled 
refueled one time in order to make the journey. After that, it utilizes gravity in order to continue the journey back and forth between Earth and Mars. During the time period when Earth and Mars are closest to one another, this transition time is only 147 days, which means that the Mars cycler can make multiple visits to both Earth and the red planet while the two planets are in close proximity to one another because you're not having to spend any fuel to accelerate or decelerate during the journey. Now, Starship still serves an important purpose here. Starship is necessary in order to construct the cycler ship in the first place. And once again, since you're not having to escape Earth's gravity, you can make the cycler ship as big as you want to, and it can carry as many passengers as you want to as well, which means that once you have the ship constructed, you can be transitioning as many as a thousand colonists at a time instead of a hundred, depending on the size of the ship. And as you're going to see later on, these ships can actually be quite colossal. But first of all, how do you carry out the intercept in low Earth orbit or whatever orbit that the cycler is going to be at when it arrives at Earth? And also, how do you deliver the colonists down to Mars when the cycler arrives at that destination? Well, first of all, you need to talk about the various space stations that are going to be used in this architecture. That's a very important part of this process. You have Johnson Prime in Earth orbit, and then you have what we call Aries Prime, which is probably based on Phobos in Mars orbit. At Johnson Prime, you have what's called intercept ships, which move to intercept the cycler as it goes by. Obviously, these intercept ships have to go to a very high velocity in order to make that intercept, and the intercept is made on what's called a hyperbolic trajectory, which means that the ship will ultimately return to Earth after carrying out its intercept in order to be reused. However, it's going to take a very long time for that hyperbolic orbit to be completed, which means if you fail to carry out your intercept with the cycler, the passengers on board are essentially dead. But once again, the advantage of all of this is the intercept ship doesn't need to carry much in the way of supplies or atmosphere or anything else because all of that is on the cycler. All you're carrying are the passengers. And the number of passengers that are going to be carried on the cycler, as I mentioned, before are pretty colossal. But once again, a very dangerous process, something that we would probably carry out with cargo for the first couple of times to make sure that it's safe before we try to do it with human beings. But as dangerous as this may seem, it's even more dangerous to try to do things the SpaceX way, which I'll explain a little bit later on. Now, the cycler ship is divided into 17 decks with roughly three meters between each deck, as shown in this particular figure, and you also have the number of passengers that are dedicated to each deck indicated on the right-hand side of the figure. So obviously, in the coach area of the ship, with six decks dedicated to 480 passengers, you don't have a lot of room per passenger, although significantly more than passengers had on transatlantic voyages between Europe and the New World. And then, of course, the upper decks are for those who want to to have a more luxurious travel, and they would pay a lot more for this benefit, which would be one way to fund the entire colonization effort. Now, the middle decks carry no passengers, but instead focus on life support and recreation. Deck 6 has food grown by hydroponics and biological water recycling. Deck 7 includes food grown by aeroponics and biological air recycling, and on Deck 8, food is grown using automation with mechanically processed air and water. And then on Deck 9, you have food preparation and consumption doing double duty as a center for card games and board games. And then on Deck 10, you have the Mechanical Environmental Control and Life Support System, or ECLSS, which are dually redundant, plus the food storage for the trip.
trip. Think pallets of meals ready to eat, or possibly some more appetizing options. And then finally, on deck 11, you have the local fitness center designed to help compensate for the low gravity. Now, the upper decks are mostly dedicated to the crew, but also to those high-paying first-class passengers. And you can see that you have the same number of berths dedicated to each particular deck, indicating that on each deck that you have larger berths, well, those people are obviously paying more money. And by the way, if you're wondering what those big central black things are, well, those are actually transfer corridors, or rather transfer tubes would be the best way to describe those that go the full length of the ship, providing transportation for the crew. So you have the command up in the nose of the ship, and then subsequent decks dedicated both to the crew and also to the first class passengers. So if you combine these first class berths in the nose of the ship with the coach class cabins at the base of the ship, you end up with 512 passengers. And by the way, you can cram about that many people into the fairing of Starship. A single Starship, if you're not worried about the supplies or the space required for an interplanetary journey, but just for a brief transition, which means you could use one Starship to enter intercept the cycler with 512 people on board, transfer those passengers onto the cycler, and then those passengers make the rest of the trip. What's the advantage to this? Well, obviously you're carrying a whole lot more passengers without having to use any fuel. Again, the cycler is operating almost entirely off of the gravitational effects of its orbits and not off of any sort of propellant. Now, some interesting design alternatives include Includes using a magnetic sail in order to increase the speed of the cycler and then to decelerate it upon arrival to give it a little bit of extra velocity and also that same magnetic technology would also allow the cycler to have an electromagnetic field generated around the crew compartments providing a tremendous amount of protection against cosmic rays and solar radiation in addition to that all of the water could cycle around on the exterior of the ship, that is to say the water supply for the passengers, also for the atmosphere, etc., for life support, providing additional protection against radiation. Also, if you duplicated the ship, in other words, create two cyclers that have 512 passengers apiece, connect them with a tether and have them orbit one another, then the centrifugal force creates artificial gravity. Now, on top of this, another way in order to connect continue providing the necessary supplies to Earth orbit in order to make just about anything delivered from Earth unnecessary. In other words, all you have to do is deliver passengers from Earth, everything else being provided by space-bound resources, will you set up another cycler from the Moon to Earth constantly carrying supplies, whether it be propellant, additional food supplies, additional equipment for the colonists, all of that constantly constantly being sent to and from the moon, utilizing the same system except on a much smaller scale and a much more ongoing scale, so you're constantly providing supplies from the moon to the Earth. That way you can be supplying your Mars ships continuously and also building a hell of a cis-lunar economy. As I mentioned before, Buzz Aldrin came up with this concept first. The Mars cycler came much later in order to build an ongoing cis-lunar economy. But let's get back to the Mars cycler. How do you drop off the passengers on Mars while you're flying past the planet? Once again, you're not going to be orbiting it. Well, by detaching landers from the ship as you're making your pass and having those landers use an aero capture maneuver in order to reduce their velocity. Even though Mars' atmosphere is incredibly thin, it is dense enough to provide a hell of a lot of deceleration. Then either you rendezvous with a base on Phobos, Ares Prime, or you deploy directly onto the Martian surface. So no deceleration via fuel really required, only just a little fuel required for maneuvers. And then you have inflatable heat shields, very similar to the lofted that was 
recently tested by ULA deploying these landing ships down onto the surface of Mars. And by the way, these landing ships would also serve as the initial habitats for the arriving colonists. Now, the reason that this is better than the Starship's belly flop maneuver going into the Martian atmosphere is the lofted provides a lot more air resistance than Starship does. It's just better suited for it, and you can't really build a lofted that would be compatible with Starship. Instead, you would have these cylindrical landing craft with the lofted underneath it providing the maximum amount of air resistance. This would be sufficient to deliver landing ships as heavy as 20 metric tons apiece, whereas Starship really can't decelerate, at least with the atmosphere alone, any slower than a spine-tingling 1,000 kilometer per hour terminal velocity, which is what terminal velocity is on Mars, and relies very much on its engines to provide that last-second deceleration. This is a safer method and requires less fuel in order to deliver the colonists safely to the Martian surface than trying to do what I call the Starship Suicide Dive. Now, although this plan has been around for a while, I don't think it's gotten a whole lot of publicity, and that's very unfortunate because this is a very effective way of delivering lots and lots of human beings to the surface of Mars in a short amount of time. 512 people per cycler, or maybe more than a thousand per cycler if you use two of them connected by that tether system. Even better is the fact that the cycler can make three journeys between Earth and Mars with every conjunction, meaning that every two years, you could transition as many as 1,500 to 3,000 people from Earth to Mars, meaning that in a 10-year period, you could transition as many as 15,000 people between Earth and the Red Planet, which would be more than enough to build a colony. We're not just talking about building a city, we're talking about building a civilization. And with 15,000 people with a cross-section of necessary skills and talents, you would have a thriving civilization on Mars in only 10 years. And once again, with only a couple of cyclers and also the ships necessary to build it in the first place. But once the system is built, it can continue transitioning people and cargo to the Red Planet on an ongoing basis, essentially forever. And there's a lot more details in this plan, so I have it linked in the description. Also, for those of you in the Toronto area, don't forget, I'm going to be there on Thursday the 7th, coming up very, very soon indeed. So please don't forget that between 6.30 and 8.30, and I have the information in the description as to all the particulars. Please like and please subscribe. It's incredibly important to the success of my channel channel and also please check the description for various ways to support this content so I can keep bringing it to you in the future and as always stay angry about space <laughs>